Hi, my name is... And I'm here to talk to you about Diablo 4, a video game by Blizzard Entertainment, or Activision Blizzard. The name is somewhat confusing. You see, they're an entertainment entity, not to be confused with the Blizzard treat from the Dairy Queen restaurant chain. Now, I should mention that I'm somewhat of a novice, having zero investment into Blizzard's other gaming franchises, be it World of Warcraft, Starcraft, Overwatch, or Diablo. In fact, this is the first Blizzard game that I've played ever. And it could very well be my last. Just wanting to put that out there. Okay, let's cut the bullshit and get to the point. Is Diablo 4 a good video game? Well, the answer depends on specifics, such as viewpoint and context of the argument. I'm someone who likes to do research before I upload any kind of critical take on a product. For example, even though this is the first and only Diablo game I've played, I know that Diablo 2 is the most popular entry in this franchise. I know that most players of Blizzard's audience found Diablo 3 to be distasteful mainly due to its awkward cell shaded presentation, among other things. But when it comes to Diablo 4, the general consensus is that it's not very good. In fact, many have said that it's just not good, period. I was curious about why the reception on Metacritic was low across the board, and it became obvious to me rather quickly just what the problem is with Diablo 4 that has soured the taste of many in the community. Of course, I ran into some takes that were telling people to go and play a piece of shit like Final Fantasy 16 over Diablo, claiming that those who were disappointed by the latter will somehow enjoy the former, which could be considered as the very definition of a mirror world. But the gaming community is not known for smarts. Still, you know what? That's why I'm here. I will give a grounded, no-nonsense critique on Diablo 4 by someone who isn't familiar with any other previous game in the series. Now, before, it was mentioned that I'm aware of what the core issue is with this game. But before I get ahead of myself, let's start with what's good. Diablo 4 does get some things right, particularly in two areas, combat and storytelling. First off, the combat system in Diablo 4 is very basic and straightforward. You're given up to five different abilities that the player is able to map to the controller on various buttons, most of which have a cooldown upon use. This is a real-time ARPG game, so everything happens at the press of a button. I did play this game on PC, and I did use a DualSense controller during the 25 hours I spent with this. The response was one to one. You initiate an action, that action is carried out, no pause, no waiting except during cooldown times, which vary from skill to skill. There is a good variety of enemies that become more varied throughout the experience, and they're a fun challenge to face most of the time. At the beginning, the legions of the Burning Hells are rather light. However, the farther you go in the game, the stronger you get, the more enemies that the game throws at you at once. It never becomes overwhelming or too ridiculous, at least until you reach the health stage. The game has these enemies known as shamans, who can summon other demons on screen. You'll find yourself becoming quickly overrun from a literal horde that just bombards you and will follow you almost anywhere you go. It's to the point where you're literally fighting a legion of enemies that will flood your entire screen. It sounds fun, but it's actually quite annoying, frustrating, and I didn't enjoy this stage for that reason aside from the art direction, which is stellar throughout the entire experience. The thing about facing a legion in a video game is that it's only done when the developer is attempting to give the player this power fantasy, that you're all powerful and nothing, absolutely nothing can stop you, stand in your path, prevent your progress. The problem with this mentality is that this is a video game, and because it's a video game, it creates a problem when you place this many enemies on screen like this because it overwhelms the player. The problem is exacerbated when you give certain NPCs ridiculously stupid buffs like increased health, as if they didn't have enough health to begin with. This game may be an RPG, but there's no rhyme or reason to turn the game into a slog fest full of inane design choices to the point where it ends up pissing off your player base, to the point where they see fit to downvote your game to hell on a review aggregate website. But I digress. Continuing onward. You have five different classes, which include the Rogue and the Druid, both of which I was curious to try out, but 
I like having superpowers in my RPG games, which is why I chose Vanguard in the Mass Effect series, and it's also why I chose to be a sorcerer in this game. Unfortunately, the classes here aren't as varied as what you have in the Mass Effect series, which is my personal favorite RPG franchise, mind you. The same holds true for the character customization, which is severely limited by comparison. Regardless, I try to be as well-rounded as possible when I play a game like this for my progression. And the progression, while limited, does allow players to build their character to a specific skill set. In fact, that's actually one of the things I found to be rather weak. You have this extended skill tree full of unique abilities, but the game will funnel you to a specific path by force. I can't have all of the skills that I want. I must pick and choose. For the sorcerer, the question was made simple. Do I want to make a fire mage, an ice mage, or a lightning mage? Well, I don't like being given such choices, so my resolve was simple. I chose to pick from all three, creating a well-balanced character that's as good at close quarters combat as he is at long-range offense. And even though I was satisfied in the end with my build, if I was the lead combat designer for this game, there definitely wouldn't be a 5 skill limit for the combat system. I'd argue that having such a limited number of available skills only hampers the game's emphasis on delivering a power fantasy to the player. Of course, there's only so many buttons on a controller. So a way around this would have been to provide a deck, say up to 3 or 4 that consists of 5 skills that the player can customize to their liking. This would allow players to swap out movesets on the fly, and it would allow greater access to a long list of skills for any one specific class. Hogwarts Legacy, another RPG game that was released earlier this year, did the exact same thing, and it effectively solved the problem. The way Blizzard tackles this issue was less effective. Because they limit you to only 5 skills, their solution to this is to allow players to respect their previous skill points. To do this, you need to spend gold, which is the in-game currency for Diablo 4. The higher your level, the more skills you obtained, the more gold you must spend to refund your skill points so you can then invest them into something you do want to change your combat build. It's simple, but it only makes the game aggravating. And even though you can swap out skills during combat since there's no real pause button that actually pauses the game, because of the sheer number of enemies thrown on screen and the aggressiveness of those enemies, you don't want to take the risk of shifting around skills in the middle of a combat encounter. Had Blizzard simply just kept things easy and used some common sense, players wouldn't have to respect anything outside of just wanting to try out some different abilities on the rare occasion. They could just instead simply swap out a deck. So essentially, the combat is good. It's fun, but it's played by strange off-the-wall design that feels dated, which drags down the quality of the experience. But generally... Blizzard did a good job with the combat system. The bosses I found to be quite enjoyable as well, and mind you, I played this game from start to finish on World Tier 2. Diablo 4 has four difficulty settings, which can be attributed to the standard easy, normal, hard, and very hard. Out of the four different world tiers which list the recommended level for the player to be at should they choose to raise the difficulty, you only have access to the first two world tiers at the start of the game. World Tier 3, which starts at level 50, and World Tier 4, which caps the leveling system off at level 100, are locked until the player reaches the initial recommended level, and I never play a video game on the easiest difficulty setting unless I'm hunting for achievements. Regarding the World Tiers, I think this is a good approach to difficulty. It encourages players to play further with increased experience incentives to kill stronger enemies, but it doesn't solve the game's biggest flaw, which I'll get to that. Before I do, I want to talk a bit about the story in Diablo 4, which is easily the game's strongest aspect. The story in Diablo 4 is intriguing throughout, from start to finish, and it works primarily for two reasons. For one, it doesn't overstay its welcome like many other RPGs. If you just focus on the campaign and nothing else, this is a 25-hour game, period. While 25 hours may sound short, it's actually in good taste. Video games generally get weaker the longer they go on. The gameplay loop becomes predictable and dull, and the experience becomes rudimentary and trite after so many hours. Very few games can actually get away with having an extended length, and if the game is story-driven, as most of them are, it takes a skilled narrative designer to make that work. Shorter video games tend to have better storytelling across the board for this very reason. Diablo 4 has a good story, 
It has some interesting characters, but the main reason for why it works so well is because of the villain. Lilith is a great antagonist. Her goal is reasonable and kept simple, and her appearance throughout the game is used sparingly so that every time she does appear, she's menacing. It also helps that Caroline Faber, who voices the character, prefers to use a subtle tone to emphasize this passive vibe, which hides the character's deceptive, wicked nature. It's very effective. What have you done with him? Away, demon. I deny you. You have grown so frail. I can make you the hero you were. Return to the darkness from whence you came. I said away! Every time Lilith appears, she moves the plot forward. The story never stagnates in Diablo 4, and the stakes are continually raised, leading up to a satisfying two-stage fight with Lilith by the end. Some of the side characters such as Donan and Loreth are given appropriate screen time to make them relevant to what's going on, and the voice acting is great all the way around. The game may not have a lot of explanation regarding lore as other RPGs, but that's okay. It's better to have a finely tuned narrative with limited lore than to have no narrative or a badly executed narrative with an overabundance of lore. It's a trade-off that works. So the story is good in Diablo 4, and the combat system is good in Diablo 4. Then, what is the real problem here? Well, to put it simply, two words. Live service. Diablo 4 is a live service game that's online only, meaning you must be connected to the internet 24-7 in order to play it, and you must have a stable internet connection to play it. Now, I don't know how this works on console, considering you must pay to play anything online on console, but again, I played this game on PC. I had a stable internet connection throughout most of my experience. Yes, there were moments where the game would lag and my character would teleport around and the game would skip entire frames because I was downloading something on a different device other than my laptop, such as a game on my Steam Deck, or I was listening to a YouTube video as I was playing the game, and at times it would affect my experience with the game. However, for the most part, my connection was stable and I experienced very few interruptions. Also, there are other players that are playing the game that you'll encounter, but considering they're off doing their own thing, I just ignore it. There was only one random live event that I played where two other players showed up and assisted fighting a wave of enemies, but there was no interaction beyond that. And after it was over, we each went our separate ways. I basically played this entire game by myself as if it was an offline single player experience. Still, it goes without saying that having an actual offline option 
would have made this game better. The reason there is no offline option is because of Blizzard. After looking through several of the clutter of random menus, including notably the shop menu, which lists prices for random things like equipment and character skins, along with prices for microtransactions, the most expensive of which is a $100 expense package, it quickly became clear to me what kind of game this is and what the developer's intention is. Blizzard's goal here is to make as much money as possible by any means possible, and they intend to do that by ripping off their audience every chance they get. It's so bad that they've included something called Seasons into the game, which is basically a random assortment of content complete with absurd task lists that are designed to force the player to do boring, mind-numbing things in order to unlock asinine rewards. And this is all served on a strict timeline, usually a monthly basis from what I noticed just glancing at all of this. The seasons themselves is something that's not even remotely new. It's been done, unfortunately, in other games, including Blizzard's Overwatch series. I myself had flashbacks of the egregiously terrible Mortal Kombat 11, with the shitty Combat League online mode as well as Square Enix's infamous Avengers game, which was also a live service title. Look, live service games aren't going away because modern players have and will continue to support them. And it's a shame because live service, without a doubt, is one of the worst, if not the worst thing that has happened to video games. Despite the fact that microtransactions are usually optional, and in Diablo 4's case, they don't actually impede on the game's difficulty in any way, the primary problem with live service games is that they have made true offline single-player games more scarce since publishers are finding fewer reasons to make a game that's a one-and-done experience because they can't bring players back to profit off the title beyond initial completion, which is why live service exists. I, for the life of me, can't understand why players still choose to play a game like this well beyond completion of the campaign, opting to play hours of copy-paste dungeons and fetch quest side missions, only to subsequently go on the internet and post reviews and comments about how upset they are at Blizzard for doing what any company does which is to trick consumers into spending as much money as possible in order to make greater profit and raise share and stock price. I'm not defending Blizzard here, but at this point, there's been so many examples of why live service is bad for this industry that if you support these practices in any way, if you purchase a single microtransaction to invest into any digital cosmetic item, if you spend hours wasting your time to complete timed events, then whose fault is it at that point? Yours. Not Blizzard's, not any other company. It's your fault because you should know better at this point. At the end of the day, Diablo 4 is a good game for the length of its campaign. After one completes the campaign, stop playing. At that point, it's designed only to waste your time and encourage you to spend more money on the game than what it's truly worth. This game would have been better if they had actually made it a single player experience. Focusing on that first while providing some optional multiplayer and left out the live service elements entirely. But this is the modern gaming industry, so it is what it is. What's done is done. I enjoyed my time with it, but beyond the campaign, it's a predictable time waster that doesn't actually benefit those who invest greater time into it. Oh, and next time, Blizzard. Don't put a limit on the stash system. There shouldn't be a limit on how many items players can have in an RPG game. That was just fucking stupid. Don't do that again. Do not speak to you anymore. Protect me! No, you belong in hell.